Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 12. The next round is on you. Gaming at cafes and pubs. Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions, and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone chatting here in the lobby on Twitch. It's really encouraging to see the support we've been getting here. You can join us live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. T.R. Knight writes, Wow. M-O-T-U, Masters of the Universe. Game sounds horrible. What a fun IP. Perhaps with the new movie coming, they might try a new game. Thanks, DR. Jackson Harold on Facebook wrote, Luckily I haven't had any of the played any of these. <laughs> Except Werewolf, but I've only played the one night variation, and I find that one to be really good for non gaming groups when they come over for a drunk game night. Thanks for writing, Jackson. While I'm not a fan of the full version of Werewolf, as I'm sure you've heard on the show multiple times, I can be talked into playing the One Night ver variation. It fixes the two main problems with the base game, that of player elimination, and the fact that at the beginning of the game you have no information, so it's just a popularity contest. Isaac Rennie Alexander says... Try Masters of Umdar. It uses the Fate Engine and gives you the after-school schlock needs. Schlock needs. Thanks for the suggestion, Isaac. Phil Hatfield on MeWe writes, I can say truthfully that there is no harm in disliking Cards Against Humanity. Apples to Apples is better, and it's barely a game. Cards Against Humanity is just crass jokes, dirty minds. No game in it. I completely agree. Apples to apples can be just as crash, but crass. Wow, I can't talk today. Apples to apples can be just as crass, but it actually takes some creativity on the part of the players. Plus, you don't have to go there when you play apples to apples. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. Yeah, yeah. You can also contact us all over social media. Just look for Tabletop Bellhop as one word on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, G+, and now me, we. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com. So it's been a really busy week, uh, actually the last few weeks, and I'm sure the week's coming up due to Extra Life coming up. Uh, it's a worldwide charity event that we're taking part on here in Windsor. We've got tons going on this year, and November 3rd is fast approaching. So I've been a little tied up and not quite getting done as much as I would have liked, and as much gaming as I would have liked. We'll talk more about it later, but you can always stop by windsorextralife.com. That's correct. Now, I did find time to record a Mackie Stack unboxing. This is a, a game from Blue Orange Games. Uh, my phone is finally fixed. Well, mostly. Uh, mm -hmm. The company that put the new lens on it, I don't know if they gave me a kind of not-so-great lens or if they smudged it a bit when they put it on or possibly I did some actual damage to the lens. But it, fortunately, is not taking as good a picture as it was before. Uh, the video turned out okay it wasn't amazing um i did notice because of bandwidth issues recording from a phone that you have to keep things still or it pixelates really quickly so i need to steady the images more um pause more often when i'm moving things move a little slower i'm also thinking of trying to stay on the tripod the other way around i also learned the important lesson of do not record from the tripod facing up thankfully sean cut that part of the video nose video is not your friend no. But you can check out the video on our YouTube channel. We would love to give you a clean link like youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop. But we you need would. to hit 100 subscribers for that. So head over, search for tabletop bellhop, check out the video, and then smash that subscribe button to give us a hand. Excellent. Well, we would definitely appreciate that. I couldn't even tell you what our YouTube URL is. I have to search it every time because it's like crazy bunch of letters. 
So besides unboxing Mackey Stacks, I also played a couple games with the kids. Now, this is a really cool game with amazing wood components. Like what you have is a tatami mat. That's actually cardboard. Uh, everything else is wood. You've got a little um, soy sauce container. You've got a California roll. You've got a dish with some wasabi in it. All these different pieces of Mackey and sushi, big wooden chunks. All fully painted. Looks really neat. I, actually, it looks like some of the kids' toys. I remember buying for like their kids' kitchen, right? The actual game is really simple. You flip a card and it shows a bunch of these components stacked up. And then you have to stack the parts up. So the game itself is meant to be a team game. Where one player, like your team's a two. So one player is moving the parts, but they're blindfolded. The other player is telling them how to manipulate the parts and what to do. It sounds hilarious. Now, there were only three of us, me and the two kids. So we just played with the two player rules, which didn't involve any blindfolds. In this one, everyone's trying to build their own stack, but you have to use chopsticks, which in that game means two fingers. You have to use the points of your fingers to manipulate the pieces. On the basic rules, you use your index fingers. The advanced rules, you use your pinky fingers to manipulate these parts. You know, when when control of your extremities d designs the difficulty level of your dexterity game, you're doing it right. Yeah, that, that's that's a dexterity game right there. No flicking in this one. We had a lot of fun. It, it's it's a cute game. It's a cool game. I'm glad I picked it up. Um, I'm looking forward to trying f with the full rules. Uh, the kids loved it, but I also think it's going to be really good with adult beverages. Something that fits well with the rest of this episode. Well, as long as your tatami mat that's actually cardboard is truly waterproof you know Ooh. you don't want to use it as a beer as a beer coaster that is true that might be worth laminating at some point so the only game i finished this week on board game arena was terra mystica so that shows how busy i have i've been i haven't even been finishing board game arena games um i actually completely forgot to open it like it's one of those I got an email notice and then Eric, who I've mentioned many times, who introduced me to it, was like, hey, dude, it's your turn. I'm like, oh, sorry. And I took like one turn and on the seven games I'm playing and then never went back. But I did finish Terra Mystica. I really enjoying it on there. It took a while to remember all the rules because Board Game Arena, as we mentioned before, is not the best way to learn a game. Um, but what it really made me want to do is play my physical copy. So last night, sorry, two nights ago now, on Monday, I broke it out and I... Brought it out to uh, the friends who were over, Tom and Sean, and I'm like, let's play this. And Sean's like, eh, I don't know. So we didn't get to play that. Well, we've been getting used to seeing the hourglass in your name, but you're busy. Busy yeah. life, not a bad thing. It's true. So now up next is the, the, I guess, the now weekly Gloomhaven review. Like this should almost be its own segment if we keep playing it up. Creepy music, dramatic chords, and the sound of failure? Uh, yes. Um, as mentioned last week, we decided to up the difficulty and try playing on normal. Uh, we did the side quest called the Windswept Highlands. It's an interesting quest where it's like a dash and grab where you got to go in, grab some treasure and get out. And there's sleeping monsters around the board and you don't want to wake them up because they're rather tough. And there's wind and the wind is actually like there's mechanics for the wind. It's, it's a very neat scenario that we lost very badly at. Well... We keep talking about how this sounds very video game-esque, and it sounds a lot like one of those video games that frustrates people at every difficulty. <laughs> uh, my first thought is, as much as I love it, XCOM, where you just have to get used to losing every once in a while and yep. adapt to it because the monsters are going to win. They're tougher than you. They're stronger than you. And you're just a honey bag of flesh, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, that could be the case. Uh, definitely. Um, I posted some pictures of Gloomhaven on my social media and I had a lot of people that were like, just play on easy, play on easy. It don't feel bad. And I'm like, yeah, I'm starting to think though. I got to admit with this particular mission, I'm not sure if easy would have helped. So in this, it wasn't a matter of us getting beat up by the monsters. It was, we ran out of time. We didn't escape in time. Like we, we didn't, well, time in the same way I explained, your cards are your resources in this game. And when you use your cards, they go to the discard pile or they're burned. And then every round you're going to use up two of your turns. And then at the end, like once you're out of cards, you can rest and pick some of them back up. But, and then you can only do that so many times because every time you rest, you lose a card. It's burned for good and you don't get it back. So eventually you're going to end up exhausted just by using your cards. And while that's basically what happened is it was, I would say, my fault. I play this Savas Cragheart. It's this big rock dude where he's got like glass where his chest should be and glowing light comes out. Very neat races in the game. I love it. Not Tolkien at all. Really cool. Um, the problem is my dude is slow and I didn't consider that enough. 
So the problem wasn't like it also not getting pinned by the bad guys at the end might've helped. Like that's where playing on easy would have made a difference is we might've wiped out more of the bad guys. But at this point, even if there were no guys on the board, I don't think I would have made it to the exit in time. So next time we're going to try to knock it down to easy just in case, you know what? It's more fun when you win. Um, and we'll, we'll try it again. So it's worth noting, because this came up and we were talking about the game, Sean and I, on one of the previous episodes, that many people leave the game set up. Yeah, well, we've now done that. If you go to my basement right now, Gloomhaven's set up. You can, we still have the, the Windy Highlands out there on the table. Well, it was only a matter of time. Uh, it's big. It's physically heavy, not just a uh, heavy game heavy. Yes. Uh, even with the inserts, the time involved is significant. And if you're going to be playing it regularly, it just kind of makes sense if you've got the space yep. available. So, Yeah, it makes the most sense, especially when you fail, because we're going to try the same scenario. So why put it away just to set it up again? So Saturday night uh, was the monthly game night at the CG Realm, a great local game store that's going to be playing host to all of our Extra Life events this year. I was packed. It was a full house. I, I personally got there late, and everyone was already in a game. So... Just to put it into perspective, this is not a tiny little hole-in-the-wall game shop. Uh, this is the pl- kind of place that does large magic tournaments. And so when we say a full house, uh, that's actually a lot of people. Yeah, it was. Now, I'll admit most of the people there were playing Yu-Gi-Oh! card game. There were a couple magic players, but there were people there for board games as well, which is why I was there. So I just kind of wandered around. Uh, Ian, who's one of the staff there, one of the part owners, we're, we're hanging out for a bit. And then we sat down. We talked Extra Life quite a bit since, again, they are hosting us. Um, he taught me a game, Timeline Discovery. Now, I've heard of Timeline. I think everyone's probably heard of Timeline. It's one of those games you can get at, you know, Target, Walmart, uh, Toys R Us, for those of you in Canada now. Um, fairly easy to find game. I knew it was a family game, uh, almost a party game. You basically are putting cards in a timeline in the right order. So you put out a card in the thing and it's got a date, whatever, 1682. And then you have a card that says the invention of the bottle and you decide if it's before or after 1682. It, sounded kind of neat and then i played it and it's just it's too simple like it's it's almost like i realize it's educational so i get the point but you only get four cards and like when you play a card if it's right you're it's gone and then if you're wrong you draw another card and you play all four of your cards you win so with two players it's a matter of playing eight cards unless someone screws up then maybe you're playing 10 cards because really it also wasn't very hard to figure out that bees were discovered on earth before the printing press was made so it's it's okay it was we played in like under five minutes i just i expected more well it's interesting it's uh you know fun little friendly game you just have to balance your uh balance your expectations uh up next i taught ian a game so you know quid pro pro so this one was Istanbul the Dice Game. Talked about it last week. This is one Sean had played at Queen City Conquest. Still digging it. I uh, played just as well this time. The, found a big change in this game compared to previous games in the order the mosque tiles come out. The mosque tiles give you special abilities. And what abilities are available really change things up. Uh, this was more of a slower game. There were three of us playing. Uh, there was more AP, which is a good sign, actually, I think, in a quick dice game that there was enough to think about that the game was slowed down with people making decisions. Uh, Ian was really impressed by it. While we were there, ordered some copies in for the store because he thinks it's going to be great for both game nights. And they host um, more public events that aren't for hardcore board gamers, but more the public. They also host a local gamers night, G-A-Y-M-E-R-S, L-G-B-T-Q plus game night. And they think it'll be good for that. So, You know, it's such a quick, fun game. It's easy to pick up. Um... You know, it's really enjoyable and it, it's suitable for pretty much anyone. There's no uh, there's no unfortunate content to worry about. That's true. It was getting a bit later uh, in the afternoon and I got the chance to join in a game of Yido and I turned that down. Really cool game. A lot of people compare it to um, Lords of Waterdeep, but with Samurai. I played both. I, there are some similarities to Complete Quest. Good game, but I didn't get to play it, unfortunately. Uh, I thought it was a little late in the night. I honestly didn't think the two guys playing it were going to finish the game by the end of the night. So what I did next was I played a prototype of a game, but I want to get back to that because I kind of want that to be the last thing I talk about. Uh, so what I broke out was Hamster Roll. 
Now, it was talking about this and writing about this on my top 20 list that made me want to bring it out. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Sean lost his spot. Sorry, completely lost his spot. Uh, hamster roll. St- yeah. Steve, you're distracting our co <laughs> Uh, Hamster Roll is a real evergreen game. Um, I don't think I, I, I wouldn't want to play it as often as uh, something like The Duke or Azul. Uh, but when it does come out, it's always a fun little game to play. I'm just going to sidestep since we mentioned the chat. Steve D is in there and he's asking about running a bot. So we do have a bot. We're just still trying to figure it out. I guess there's a way to find out how much time you've missed. It's, so uh, that's it's, something Sean is working on. We're actually working on uh, using a new bot that's just under under fresh development. So it hasn't got all its features yet, and they're going to be rolling out slowly. But there is a bot there. Right now, it's mostly just uh, basic moderation needs. Oh, maybe we can look at it. Steve, if you hang around till the after show, maybe we can find out what bot you're talking about. So uh, back to Hamster Roll. So finished off Hamster Roll. Uh, it was as good as I remember. There, like, There's a reason I put it on my top 20 list. Playing it this weekend didn't make me think, oh, man, I shouldn't have put that on there. No, it's good. So the first time I played with Ian and I played with two other locals, it was a fun, stressful game. You know, that's kind of how that game works. Um, we found out just how uneven the tables are at CG Realm, which was a always a part of hamster roll and, and it, something that makes the game better, not worse. Uh, the fun part though, is Ian was saying there he finished. He's like, Oh man, I got to get Sean over here. So he calls over his husband. Now his husband, Sean runs the Windsor sandwich shop. He's the man behind the amazing Detroit style Coney dogs. And let's not forget some of the other strong foods they have there. Uh, the Coney dogs are, are a top pick and the reason I wanted to go down there. But while we got there, uh, he was wandering around waving, Fresh uh, desserts under people's noses, uh, which was cruel, but they (laughs) looked fantastic. So uh, it's not just for Coney Dogs. Uh, They actually have a fantastic menu there. Yeah, very good food. They actually, uh, this big dessert thing now is dipped cheesecake. You'll have three different sauces and dip it. You pick your toppings. It's basically like an ice cream sundae bar, but a cheesecake bar. Like, come on, cheesecake bar. So anyway, Sean... Windsor Sandwich Shop, Sean, not this Sean, is not much of a gamer. So whenever Ian finds a game he thinks Sean will dig, he gets really excited. Like he was like shaking. He's like, oh, we got to get Sean to play. We got to get Sean to play. So we got Sean over to play and we played a four player game. And sure enough, he loved it. Actually, Sean loved it a lot. He had never played a dexterity game before. And this is, of course, in my opinion, one of the best. Like, he was sold instantly. He made sure Ian ordered a copy for the sandwich shop. It's another thing they're going to feature on Games Night. And he's like, I want a copy of that game just sitting out at a table all the time so people can come in and just play it. And then I know Ian just picked up, I think, three or four copies for the store to have to be able to sell once people try this. Because I'm pretty sure once people play it, they're going to want to take one home. Yeah, there's just something about a quick game with a really simple mechanic. You don't need instructions. You don't need to teach. You say you take your piece and you put it on higher than the last person's piece. That's all there is. Yep, uh, basically. And yet with all that, again, it comes up time and time again, those simple games, the complexity develops out of the play. You know, you don't need mm-hmm. tough rules to have a, a tough game. And what's nice too is it's not too simple. Like there is a strategy of what piece to place and which slot to put it in. It's not just, oh, I pick up my piece and I put it. It's not, it's not Jenga. Yeah. Like, okay, I guess there's a little bit of strategy in Jenga on what piece you pick, but like there's a little bit more in Hamster Roll. So next up is uh, something I wanted to kind of feature. So the other thing going on was a, there's a local Windsor company called Krishata Games, and they were there showing off a prototype of a game called The Earth is Ours. Now, this is a team-based card game. Uh, I watched a couple two-player games. It seemed like a pretty simple take that game where you're trying to control different zones, playing cards like really quick back and forth. Like, I attack. No, I defend. Oh, I attack. Oh, I'm out of defense. It works. Like, really fast back and forth like that. Uh, It looked kind of neat two-player, but then I actually got into a six-player game, and that's when the game shined. We've mentioned this before, but games really balance out differently. Um, and every game can uh, stand or fall based on the number of players you've got. Uh, so it's worth taking a peek if you get a chance to look at the Board Game Geek uh, listing for any game and look at the recommended player count that they yes. post there as that a lot of people will have uh, contributed and voted on what they feel is the best number of players for any particular game. Yeah, excellent. So this was a 
full open and info co-op. So what was cool about this is there was a lot of talking where you literally are showing the guy next to your hand. Like you're like, hey, I got one of these. Do you have any? Oh, do you have any yellow? Now, the thing is, you're doing this and so is the other team. And you can hear each other, which I found to be a really fascinating part of the game because I would hear them say, oh, blah, 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 blue. And I'd be like, oh, look, they're probably going to play a blue. So maybe we should save our blue. It was neat. I It seems like a, a pretty solid party game. Uh, it was very simple. Basically, you try to put a project out. The other team tries to stop you from playing it. And then you try to stop them from stopping you. And it kind of goes back and forth till one team or the other is out of cards. And either the project goes through or it doesn't. You've got it broken up over um, a bunch of different areas of the world you're trying to create take over and if you score enough points in each area you get to declare the earth is ours and that's actually part of the game is you're all supposed to one two three yell the earth is ours which i heard multiple times during the night i think this would be a great party game i uh, i think it's simple enough you could play it with kids and i also think this one will be fun to play at pubs which the designers seem to get because they're usually showing it off at a local bar called rockstar and i guess they have the earth is ours night there every thursday you know it's important to know your market and that's just not who's playing, but where. Uh, teaching a quiet home game in a crowded and noisy FLGS on Magic Night isn't going to show off your game best. Yeah. But you know, if it is a bar type game, that might just be a great environment to, t to teach. So one other thing about this game, it is on Kickstarter right now. So I'm not going to give you a full-fledged, go back it, it's amazing. Like, check this game out. Take a look at the Kickstarter, see if it's for you. If you play a lot of lighter games, like I said, it's it's very light, but I really like the team co-op version of the game where you're working against each other. It's a very take that. Uh, you're not, no serious strategy, no serious thinking, but a lot of fun where some one group's trying to take over the world and the other group's trying to stop them. Quite a bit of fun. You can check it out. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight, uh, we've had a, a few people in there, mostly just uh, listening. Steve already joined us, and we've had uh, one new follower pop in uh, and uh, drop us a follow, but not too much awesome. uh, chat going on there otherwise. Yeah, I see Steve's got a bunch of uh, suggestions on chats and chat commands for chatbots. It is something we are working on. Uh, just for the people listening at home, he's uh, talking about using the standard chatbot, whereas we use Streamlabs, their new chatbot. Uh, we are working on it. For those at home, I guess you don't really care much. But if you ever join us in our chat, we are trying to add some functionality to our chat room. And uh, that was Zovia that followed us a little while, about 10 minutes ago. Thank you for the follow. Thank you very much. So our first giveaway is going strong. Yes, it is. Last week, I posted a review of a cool piece of gamer bling called The License to Slay from the Bureau of Dragons. I had it here in front of me there. Along with the review is our first giveaway. As of right now, we already have 59 entries and there are only 13 days left. Less awesome. if you're hearing this on the podcast. That is true. Uh, so head over to the blog, tabletopbellhop.com, read the review, and if you're interested in your own license to slay, enter the contest at the bottom of the page. November 3rd and 4th, myself and a bunch of local Windsor gamers are going to be gaming for more than 24 hours in support of Extra Life. This is a charity that supports the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. The gamers of Windsor have raised $14,000 over the last five years and show no plan on slowing down. To find out more about what we're doing, and if you're interested how you can help us out, head over to www.windsorextralifeoneword.com. What would be a big help to us is spreading the word. When you see Mo sharing information about the event online, like or the people in Twitch, who, uh, the poster we're showing right now, on Twitter, Facebook, or G+, like... Comment and share. Yes, please. Now you can find us all across the web, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform. Help us spread our gaming advice to the world. Apple podcast reviews actually help us out the most, making our show show up earlier in search results. This is something I don't think we can really stress enough. There have been some recent issues and news about people hacking the podcast ratings, and that's been hurting everyone. The Apple Podcast Directory is the primary source for everyone's rankings and ratings, 
uh, even all the other sources for podcasts, except pretty much Google. So taking mm -hmm. a couple of moments to give us a rating, even if you don't give us a review, can really make a difference. Honest, real listener reviews and ratings will continue to be the best way for anyone to grow, no matter who else tries to cheat the system. Very true. Now, if you stream on Twitch and are interested in a mutual hosting agreement, we would love to hear from you. We host you, you host us, and everyone wins. Just contact Mo at TabletopBellhop.com and we can set something up. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, we'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, um, uh, maps, every anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. There's something we should throw up a graphic with a big circle on where to subscribe. And Teldern is now hosting our stream. Excellent. Thanks, Teldern. Hey, Teldern, join the chat as well. All right, we've got something special to announce. Next Thursday, the day after we record our next podcast, we will be conducting our first interview. Phil Vecchione will be joining us to talk about his new RPG, Hydro Hacker Operatives. You may remember us talking about H2O, Phil, and the rest of the GEM team during our Queen City Conquest special episode. If you missed that one, you should be able to find it in your backlog. Now, H2O is a fantastic new hydropunk powered by the Apocalypse RPG, and it's going to be great to be able to chat with Phil about this game. We invite you to join us for that interview next Thursday, October 25th. For those listening on the podcast, that's two days after this episode goes live. One last thing, if you have any questions for Phil, we'd love to pass them on. You can send them to the usual place, mo at tabletopbellhop.com or on social media. And we'll do what we can to include them in the interview. So one other thing, it looks like we're blocking links in the chat. I don't think we need to do that. Because okay. that's something we often share. We share links, Dee shared links. Well, we can. It's just uh, okay. It's no, I don't see a problem unless it becomes a problem. But yeah. then D can just moderate out the people. Right now, I know I on the misdirected mark chat, you get lots of people sharing. Yeah. Hey, look at the new shoes I bought or whatever. <laughs> Check out this Kickstarter. I'd love to change it so followers and subscribers can do it, but I think it's only yes. subscribers and nobody. So oh, that sucks. That would be cool if it was followers and subscribers. I'll take a look and see if it's possible, but I don't think so. All right. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. You can head over to the webpage, tabletopbellhop.com, and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, we also have a G Plus community, at least till next April. It's got a section for questions. I'm on Twitter pretty much all day. You can DM or at me there. Head over to our Facebook page. Hit us up there. Uh, we take questions anywhere and everywhere. We want you to be able to reach us. Today's question, Ivan Sorensen over on Google Plus asks, Gaming in pubs and cafes, what are some do's and don'ts? Thanks for the question, Ivan. I'm going to assume you mean gaming together in public places with big groups of gamers together like a game night at a pub and cafe. If I'm wrong and you want to know some great games for date night or something where your personal group of three pleeper go to the wa lo uh, go to the local watering hole, uh, just let me know. But I'm going to assume this is like you're having a game night, you're hosting a game night or attending a game night at a restaurant, cafe, or bar or pub. So don't worry, folks. This is one section of the show where we probably won't be talking about Gloomhaven. Oh, no. <laughs> Definitely not. So instead of just doing a big list of do's followed by a big list of don'ts, I'm going to go over some general advice for running and attending events at public places like pubs, cafes. I'm going to start with cafes as I can't really think of anything that doesn't apply at a pub that does apply at a cafe. Now, I can think of one rather big thing that affects playing at a pub, and that's the consumption of adult beverages. A night at the cafe is just a night at the bar for those of us who prefer to imbibe coffee instead of alcohol. Yes, often quieter, though. <laughs> now, one of the things is at home, you know your place, your space, whether it's your home or your friend's home, game night at someone's home. You know who will be there. You probably know the gamers. You have 
table rules, whether they're written or not. Every group has their own set of written or unwritten table rules. I've found written table rules are getting more and more popular as time goes on. It's not a bad idea. Uh, you know who's going to bring the food. You know if you're expected to have snacks. You know if it's BYOB or if they can help yourself to the fridge. You also tend to know the likes and dislikes of your fellow gamers. You know that they're going to enjoy playing this game or not that game. You know not to bring Werewolf if Moe's going to be there, right? You know what to expect. Now, all of this in public could be out the window. Not to mention details like table size, space. You may not be able to get that ideal corner booth you're aiming for. True. So the first thing you should do, uh, this is more on the, if you're planning on organizing an event is go check the place out. Like, and don't just like walk in, walk around to be the creepy guy who's looking in all the corners, like show up, sit down, patronize the place, have a meal, buy a drink, buy some food. Uh, while you're there, enjoy, enjoy the show, like enjoy the place, find out you like it. Uh, check out the size of the tables. As Sean mentioned, very important. How loud is it? How well lit is it? What are their hours? Is the place busy? If it isn't busy, find out when they are busy and when they're not. Are they going to want a group of gamers taking up tables for three or more hours? Uh, to buy something is key. You want to be a paying customer. You want to get and stay in the business's good books. Yes. No one wants a cheapskate nursing a single drink in their area all night. In North America particularly, tips are life for your uh, servers so if you're not buying, you're not going to be tipping and they can't afford to have you there. Fair enough. So before you have a game night, ask, you must ask, don't just show up to a place expecting them to want to have you and a group of gamers there. Talk to a manager, make sure they want you when talking to the manager, make sure you explain what your group's going to offer. Usually you're going to try to set your game night during a slow period. And what you're offering is, hey, you're dead on Saturday afternoon. I'm going to get a group of 30 people in here playing games and buying things. That's better than you have now, right? One of the things you may want to do is actually bring up the idea of a deposit. So this is something I did with the Green Bean Cafe here in Windsor. When I approached them and said, hey, I want to get a group of, and I didn't know my exact numbers, 12 to 40 gamers to show up and buy some coffee, probably have some sandwiches and use your nice, awesome big tables and your bright lights that are great for gaming. And we're going to be back in the back corner. It will be a little bit loud, but we shouldn't bother your patrons normally. And we'd love it if your patrons joined in. And they're like, no, I don't know. And I'm like, well, what would it take to have you here? How much would you have to make for it to be worth it? And they quoted me a price. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I have a feeling this is going to go really well. I will give you a deposit of X amount. If you don't make that much money, take that out of my deposit. So you're guaranteed to make your, say, 30 bucks they wanted to make that night. And if you make more than that, you give me back my deposit. We have some good games. We have a good time. And they went for it. And it worked. It was perfect. It went great. Like, it was a fairly low amount. This wasn't, this is a big coffee shop near the University of Windsor. It's not like a place that's selling 40 50 dollar meals they're not expecting to make a ton of money and they expect students that are there nursing their coffees so it wasn't a huge amount of money but this is a good way to get in there because especially if you point out to them there's no risk they're going to be more than willing to do it now this is going to vary from business to business and you really must respect the owner mm -hmm. and their wishes this is their livelihood so if they say no they have a reason please respect it and find another yes. establishment yeah, I've seen that happen where someone says no when they show up anyway. That's not good. So there's two things here. Now, again, you're looking at table space, light, how loud it is, stuff like that. Now, the place has to fit the games you're playing and the other way around as well. You want to bring games or play games that fit the place. So you can generally find games to fit any size table. It, But it's something you have to consider. Like, if you know the people that are coming will want... You, if you know the people coming and what they want to play, you're going to determine what types of games to bring based on them and the amount of space. So for different gamers, if they, they may not fit the venue, so you don't want to invite your Hex Encounter Grognard group to a place with those little tiny round coffee shop tables. It's just not going to work. And then also think about the table layout. So 
they may have nice square three by three tables uh, and you would like a six by three that would work perfectly, don't move those tables without getting permission from management, the servers or the owner. Somebody has to let you move those tables and, and perhaps even move them for you. Yes. Um, don't just go rearranging a restaurant or cafe. Yes, actually, this one's uh, more important than you would think. It is actually a labor law issue and a potential insurance issue and a health risk if you move the tables and they don't. In general, you want to get them to rearrange the tables. Uh, this is something that I'd never even thought of until we were at Origins one year and we went to move a table and they freaked. So for one, it was it's a union job to move tables. So we were stealing a union job by moving tables. And second, if one of us got hurt moving the table is a huge legal risk to them no we were in the states so that may be a little different here but in general let them move the tables they're their tables well convention convention centers are, are an exception on their own that's yeah. a very heavy union area having worked in many convention centers over the years you just don't do anything you let some you someone from some union do it for you yeah so another thing to look at is the chairs if you are playing long games, it means sitting for a long time. So if you're looking for those three, four hour games, which I don't really recommend for playing at these type of events, but if you're looking for longer games, uh, make sure the chairs are comfortable. Bar seating is a thing. Many pubs, restaurants, cafes have bar seating. These are great for quick party style games or stuff where you're going to get up and move around a lot, but you don't want to be sitting on a bar stool for a three hour game. So we've got chairs, tables, uh, and also, when you're thinking about your tables, don't forget that while you may be playing a game of Azul, and you can do that on a tiny little table, it only takes a couple of things, uh, in many cases, you're going to have food or beverage there with you. Don't forget that you can't just think, oh, I've got a two-by-two two table, this game takes two-by-two, two. great. You need somewhere to put, put drinks and things, and you mm -hmm. may not be able to always be uh, rearrange. So your table size actually equals your game size plus an added allowance for the food and beverage for those people who uh, may be sitting there if you're going to allow food and beverage at a gaming table, which we'll get into. <laughs> Correct. Uh, the next thing you want to look at is how loud is it? You want to pick games based on that. If it's too loud, maybe it's not a good spot for gaming at all. Like, if it's a loud place, you are got to stick to games where you're not having to talk to each other. The other thing is also true. If it's too quiet, you don't want your game group there playing games like Happy Salmon, which is a ridiculously loud, over-the-top game. Quiet place, you want games that require concentration. You're going to look at Euro games, thinky games. Now, if it's a louder place, that's when you start considering your party games, your dice games, and stuff with lots of interaction. Now, even in a louder environment, you still need to respect the other patrons there. You don't want to reason, be the reason a resistance gets one star on Google because of obnoxious loud patrons bothering the clust customers. Those are still Very paying true. customers. Even if you're a paying customer, you still have to respect the other paying customers. Yeah, in this case, anytime you're there with a game group, consider yourselves guests, not customers. That's the way I like to think of it. Now, an important thing you need to have if you are at a game night and you are hosting a game night is it doesn't have to be you but you need a host you want someone greeting people within minutes of them walking in the door if not seconds you want to go up to people and say hey are you here for game night and if they're not welcome them say hey we're doing games on this side what you're done eating why don't you come over or hey we're going to be here it's going to be a little louder than usual i hope that's okay with you you're welcome to join us if you want the other thing that host is going to do is get people into games don't just expect people to show up People are shy, especially gamers. It seems to be a universal thing. People showing up to a new place are not going to be comfortable walking up going, oh, can I play that? Oh, do you have room for another? That's not something most new gamers are going to do. And you have to assume anyone showing up is a new gamer unless you know otherwise. So you want to try to get people into games. So one of the common things you're going to do is let people know when there's room at a game. So if you're hosting, uh, even better, get the people do, playing the games to do this. In any event I'm doing, I will do a, hey, about to start Settlers of Catan, room for two players. Or, hey, they're about to start 
seven wonders over there. They've got five. They can start with five, but we got room for two more if you want. The other thing to try to do is try to get people to mix it up. One of the main reasons for playing in public is to meet new gamers, to get out and game with new people, not the people you game with all the time at home. What you also want to do is meet some people to invite to those home games so your personal game group grows. But you're not going to do that if you play with the same people every week. Like there's a group in Windsor here that every time we have a game night, grab a table, put it up in the brightest lit area of the thing and play a five hour game of Merchants and Marauders and go home. And I honestly don't understand understand why they don't just stay home and play like i don't get what they're getting out of coming out to the event like i'm happy to have them and the place we were playing at is usually happy because they usually buy drinks but i've just kind of confused i'm like the whole point is to kind of meet people and now while the host doesn't have to be the organizer um they do need to be able to coordinate and communicate with the organizer and they need to be aware of anything the uh, establishment has uh, planned or uh rules and, and, and things that need to be in mind of. If everyone needs to be out by 10 o'clock because something else is happening there, everyone needs to be uh, aware and plan for that. Yeah. So bonus tip. This is for someone organizing a game night. Have signs. I have the most basic signs in the world. All they are is orange cones. I give them out to groups when they show up and say they're starting a game. I say, if you are starting a game looking for players, put an orange cone on your table. Once your game starts, take the cone off, put it under the table. That way, when I greet someone coming in, I can say, hey, look around. If you see any orange cones, those people are looking for games. Even better is a full sign system where you have signs that say looking for players. Or another really useful one is looking for game teacher. Uh, I usually see these at cons. It's really cool to use them at local events. If I could just find some cheap dollar store standees to hold cards i would be doing this myself for some reason restaurants i don't know where they get those standees but i can never find them so another consideration is where are people going to put their stuff it's sad that we have to talk about this but at events games can go walking it has unfortunately happened at events i've been part of um, at best, you want somewhere they can be locked up or behind the counter. At all of our local game stores now, I bring milk crates full of games, and all the owners know me well enough. I just put my games behind the counter. I go behind the counter. I get them out. We play, and then I put them back behind the counter. Something like that is perfect. Now, if you can't do that, you want to have somewhere where there's lots of eyes on it, somewhere bright in the public, in the middle of everyone. I hate to that you have to do this, but unfortunately, it is an issue with playing in public. Now, we also have to be aware that it may not always be malicious theft, but confusion. Um, a large group of gamers playing in a cafe could give the impression in this day and age where there are a lot of board game cafes that what is happening is a board game cafe. And yes. someone may completely innocently grab a game that isn't being played to go play it off in the corner. And, you know, that's, you know, and everyone else is packing up to leave and no one notices that the couple over there is happily playing something. Um, but... Again, either way, it needs to be watched out for, uh, whether it's innocent or malicious. Mm -hmm. That adds a good point. Actually, if you can, make sure you know which games are yours. Uh, you might want to put your names on them. You might want to put a post-it note. You might want to put something inside. It might be worth doing. I know I've been at a gaming event and brought home a game that wasn't mine, and someone else brought home a game that wasn't theirs, and it ends up we grabbed each other's copies. I hadn't even considered that when first talking about this. But yeah, it's something to consider. I don't know if you want to put a sticker on it or whatever, but whatever you can do so you know whose game it is. So up next is be courteous. So this applies to many things, but you're not at home. You are a guest in a public place. Act like a guest. You're probably playing with strangers. You want to make a good impression. Now, I'm not going to get into how to be courteous. It's just it should be common sense. I realize that not all is just don't be that person. Uh, and that goes for being courteous to the other gamers the hosts, the organizers, but also other patrons, uh, the wait staff, and, and, and other persons in the business, mm -hmm. um, and just other people around the, ca uh, the cafe or bar. Yes, and courteousness also extends to the games themselves. Don't fold cards. What is it with people who like to fold cards? I don't understand. What are people's compulsion to fold things? It drives me nuts. If you are that kind of person, don't play card games. Go play big block games where you can't bend stuff. I don't know. Uh, when 
playing cards, riffle shuffling is not nice on cards. Before you grab someone else's game and riffle shuffle, ask, is it okay if I riffle shuffle this? Or let the game owner do the shuffling. Um, if you're eating, please do it away from the games. Like, avoid food like ribs and finger foods totally if you can. But if not, like, do it somewhere else. Like, go grab another table, finish eating, go to the washroom, wash your hands, then come back and play. If you're drinking, use coasters. There is a chance that will save something. But even better, if you can, have the drinks on a separate table. You want to treat these games as if they were your own. Like, people, these are other people's property. Treat them as if they were your own. And if you treat your games like crap, maybe you shouldn't be going out to public game nights. Yeah, my, my, my thought was uh, maybe Peter, treat it better than your own games because some people treat yes. their games like crud. Uh, treat them like you were testing it at a store and you hadn't paid for it yet. Uh, yeah, re re <laughs> you know. Remember that if you broke it, you bought it. Assume that's true. It's it's that's something if you there is a good point. If you do damage someone else's game, buy it off the person like offer to purchase it something do something in return don't just spill a pitcher of beer into someone's game and laugh about it and think it's hilarious yes i'm speaking from experience that is one of three people i have had to kick out of the windsor gaming resource for having that attitude that ruining someone else's property is funny sorry that just got me a little no nope, no nope, that's uh it's people so, exi those people exist so moving on this one um j feel just as strongly about support the venue you are guests. You are customers. You want to be invited back. At minimum, buy a drink. Buy one every hour. Better yet, buy food or be really nice and buy a nice big sharing plate for everyone you're gaming with. Off to the side, not next to the game. Don't show up, assuming there'll be food and drink. And most importantly, do not bring your own food and drink to a pub or cafe where there's a gaming night. Seriously, people, don't do it. I, when I, uh, people have to remember, yeah, especially in North America and a lot of uh, Western countries, waiters do not get paid a decent living wage. They live their lives off of tips. Uh, and so if you aren't buying things and you aren't tipping, they aren't able to feed their family. Um, I wish it wasn't that way. I actually hate the tipping world we live in, mm -hmm. but that's the world we live in. So tip. Whether you, and, and don't tip based on service. Tip. Just tip. Yes. <laughs> and and not like if you're going to a game night, I don't even keep track of like what I bought. I just like give them a 10 or a 20 at the end of the night. Right. Like even if I'm on dr drinking coffee for the night, it's it's one of those things that that you want to be invited back. Like this place is giving you a space to play games with lots of people. You're getting to get those games off your shelves and playing them. You're getting to meet other local gamers. You're socializing. You're building a community. Like there are so many great reasons to play in public. Thank the place that's letting you do this. So now moving on to pubs. So everything I said above, as far as I can tell, I still haven't figured out anything. It doesn't apply to both. Everything above applies to pubs. Now, the biggest change, of course, is the fact there are going to be drinks. One of the most important rules is don't get drunk. It's not a night out with your friends. This is not drinking night. This is game night where drinking is meant to be part of the fun. It's not the point is to drink. Don't overdo it. Now, if you're an organ or uh, if you are an organizer and see someone overdoing it, talk to them. Or if you're not comfortable doing that, talk to the venue. If you find you are drinking and you can't help yourself, you're one of those people that has a hard time stopping. I will admit, that's me. Step away from the games. Find someone else who just wants to sit and chat and have some drinks, sit over in the corner, drink, talk, hang out. Just don't interfere with those that are there to play games. Now, if this is something you're looking to organize regularly, a regular game night out at uh, an adult beverage establishment, uh, Consider looking at your whatever your region has, whether it's Smart Serve, Serve Safe, or the equivalent in your area. Uh, if wait staff is serving intoxicated patrons, speak to the owner. There are rules and legislations involved in serving people to the point of uh, intoxication. Um, so just be aware and and be aware of, uh, for yourself so that you can you or your host or the organizer can act as someone to watch out and uh, be aware because. The person who gets intoxicated is the one who is more likely to accidentally or intentionally 
damage things and or damage Correct. your reputation and your chance to play at that uh, venue. Yeah, and as Sean mentioned, at a pub, there is more chance of things getting damaged. So even more so than at a cafe, you want to protect your games. So we kind of mentioned this before, but at bars, you really do have to worry about greasy fingers, uh, toppled components, dropped cards, and probably the most important is, of course, spilled drinks. Uh, So even if it's not something you uh, normally do, Consider card condoms or sleeves yeah. or whatever you want to call them. Protect. Yeah. In general, protect your game. Sleeve your cards. Uh, consider laminating, excuse me, laminating player boards. Um, you can even go so far as to pick up Tester's Dull Coat and spray your boards. Uh, other tips for this is don't bring games with lots of components. And don't bring your shiny new $300 Rising Sun Tons of Miniatures Kickstarter or anything else you paid a significant amount, your deluxe edition of Catan, that's the pub's not the place for that. Uh, where possible, store games away from tables uh, with drinks and food. Uh, this kind of goes back to the story I was telling you earlier about the guy who spilled a pitcher of beer. Well, that happened to fall into a game because the other guy had his bag of games sitting next to the table. So, well, I don't blame the guy for keeping his games there. If he had put them somewhere safer, they wouldn't have got wet. I still fully blame the guy who spilled the pitcher of beer and laughed about it. So one thing to consider, again, if you're doing this on a regular basis and you want to set up a, uh, a, a regular o- ongoing event, uh, start, consider starting or working with a local gaming library uh, mm-hmm. where you're not worrying about people's, people's own personal collections uh, and you've just got a single source for your games that you can uh, better manage and organize and it's easier to sort of deal with. If something's damaged, everyone knows where that comes from or whether it's a community pool or whatever. So another thing to watch for is double booking. I don't know why, if maybe it's a Windsor thing, but pubs in particular, bars in particular, like to double book game night. Uh, they like to double book it with a live band. I don't know why, but a live band will kill your game night. Like, you you just can't. It's too loud. The crowds get too loud. They get upset that you're gaming. The only suggestion I actually have to stop this, and the only thing that's worked, is make it worth the venue's while. Get enough people out to fill the place. I realize that's not easy. There, We used to have game nights at a place downtown called Villains Bistro, and I had to cancel them because we did get 30 to 50 people out, which is pretty good for a local showing. Windsor's not that big, but that's only about half that bar. So they wanted to fill the other half of the bar and they're thinking, sure, a live band will be great. You can play games while you listen. I don't know. I don't know why they thought this would work, but it does not work. But watch for this. This is something for some reason bars seem to like doing it. Maybe it's something to talk to the manager about ahead of time. Like, please don't double book us. But you know what? If it's not worth their while, you can't. They don't owe you anything. You're not entitled to game in their establishment. So you have to make it worth the venue's while to not double book or get something else in there. So do not try and compete with a live band. You will lose. Uh, they can turn yeah. up louder than you can. And as a general rule, if a live band is going to play at a venue, they are bringing their friends and their friends yes. are diehard fans who will actively and sometimes violently rebel against people who are trying to disturb that band being placed. Yes. Yeah, Don't try and compete with a live band. Just find a different place. So on to some actual game suggestions. Like I mentioned a couple games while we were going through, but I wanted to leave this for last. Uh, This is the part you can skip past if you already know what kind of games you like. Uh, Basically, cafes, you want easy to teach short games. You want quick turnaround. So I mentioned this earlier. You want to meet new gamers. This is why you're out in public gaming with other people. I personally, and this seems to be a general consensus, would rather play three different games than one big, long three, four hour game. Like big games are cool. I love big, heavy games, but I save those for special events. Like those are, I play at home. Like if I'm going to play Twilight Imperium, fantastic game. It takes a long time. I'm not going to bring that out for public play. I'm going to go out to public play and I'm going to play some other games and I'll be like, Hey, do you like Twilight Imperium? Cause I'm having a lot of time, fun playing with you. How about next Saturday we get together at my place and we play Twilight Imperium. Like that's part of why you're doing this. You want to meet people to enjoy those longer games with, but while you're at the event, Keep it shorter. Keep it simple. 
now gateway games are your friend you want simple to teach uh, the, the the diehard games, the games everyone's heard of. You want your Catans, your Carcassonne, your Sushi Go quick passing uh, drafting games. You want games like Splendor, a really simple engine builder that's quick to teach. You want uh, dice rolling games that are just a step above Yahtzee, stuff like King of Tokyo. You want fun, almost family style games like Survive Escape from Atlantis or the one I prefer, Survive Space Attack. Quick games like Love Letter, where there's literally, I think, 13 cards in Love Letter, and that's all you have to teach people is what they do, and all you do is draw a card and discard a card. That's all you do every turn. Um, Co-op games like Forbidden Island uh, are great. King Domino with its really simple play where you're just matching colors, or if you have gamers, like people who seem to like a little heavier, Queen Domino. Stuff like Zombie Dice, again, another Yahtzee knockoff. Uh, and don't forget dexterity games. Uh, you know whether whether you're playing uh, hamster roll or Jenga, uh, dexterity games are a great way, great thing to play uh, when you're out. Yeah, I was going to get to those when we get to pubs because I think they fit better there. They work at cafes, but they're perfect for pubs. I'll get to that. The other thing that's great when you play in public is flashy games, games that get people's attention. What you want when you're having a public play event is, yes, you want to entertain the group of gamers you knew who were going to be there. Or maybe you didn't know ahead of time. But, like, say you've got your regular game group. You want to grow that group. You want to expand the hobby. You want to be an ambassador for the hobby, getting new people into gaming. And one of the best ways to do that is play a game that catches people's attention that are at the venue but not for your event. So games like Cash and Guns. If you're sitting there and you're having a couple drinks and you look over and you see a table where there's a bunch of people pointing phone guns at each other, you're going to want to go over and go, what the heck are you guys doing, right? A game like Takanoko with these nice wooden pieces of bamboo stepped up and a little plastic panda and it just looks neat. Or games like The Climbers where people are stacking bricks up and making a huge tower or cult express which is a programmed movement train heist game that has a 3d train as one of its components or the often mentioned on this show azul with its beautiful tiles yeah and uh, <clears throat> beware of aware of your clientele uh the kind of attention you're drawing will depend on the regular crowd of the the bar or whatever uh, especially if you're not regularly out of place and they aren't used to having gamers come in there you don't want to be at that corner bar that may have the tables for you, but also has the town drunks who get angry at night or. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The other thing I don't, don't be too ambitious trying to get people to play. Let them come to you. Don't go bothering the regulars. Hey, want to play a game? Hey, want to play a game? Yeah. When you first show up, say, Hey, we're playing some gamers over here. If you want to join us, don't bother them. Let them do their own thing. Uh, if the place is loud. Here's where you want games with lots of talking. So, like, avoid your social deduction games. Besides the fact that I usually don't even like social deduction games in the first place, you don't want games where you have to talk a lot to each other. You're going to avoid trivia games. One types of games to consider that I think are great are card games or drafting games where people are focused on their own cards and can easily look over to see what the other players are doing. So any of your... Um, Trick-taking games also fit really well. So your typical heart, spades, euchre, they all work. They're games. I have nothing against standard card games. If you want a little bit more gamery versions, look at Diamonds or Wizard. Uh, then your drafting games like Seven Wonders or Sushi Go I mentioned before. And then if you have a crowd that's a little more experienced gamers, consider your deck builders. I don't have to talk to any of my opponents when playing Clank or Ascension or Star Realms. Absolutely. The other thing you need to pay attention to is not only the volume of the patron, but the type of volume you're dealing with. Uh, a bar that doesn't have a lot of loud patrons, but has a lot of TVs around, uh, either volume on or volume off, can be far more distracting to some certain people than one with a whole bunch of people talking in your ear. Uh, stacks yes. of TVs playing sports if or you know whatever uh, catches people's attention can really distract. And if you're trying to get everyone to focus on a game in front of you, we're getting into that whole tech at the table uh, issue that, <laughs> yes. uh, uh, here, but it's not your table. It's not your tech, but it's there interfering with the table. And do not just turn off the TVs. Ask if they are bothering you. Ask the check with the other patrons. Don't just go turn TVs off. I've seen people do that. Not cool. Goes with that whole being courteous. Um, once you get to know the group. So 
assuming you go out a couple times, you're game night successful, so you have another one. That's when you can start consider bringing out your bigger games. Like, I wouldn't bring out Terraforming Mars to a first game night, but after playing with a group and learning the kind of games they like and the experience they have, i definitely bring that out. It's my number one game. Like, I love that game. But I'm not going to start with that. You want to start slow. You can always bring out a new game next week, and it's worth talking to the people who you're playing with. Like, hey, we played Catan this week. Have you guys ever played Igizia? That's like one of my favorite games. Do you guys want to try it? And you bring it next week. So, you can keep a uh, stock of games (laughs) in your vehicle if you drive, but be aware of your uh, your surroundings. Uh, If you're making trips out to your car with expensive games, that could draw unwanted attention depending on where you're at. Yeah, true enough. Um, Another side story. We used to run events at the Green Bean downtown. So the Green Bean I mentioned before had two locations. There were gamers who would not come to our downtown location. Now, downtown Windsor is not horrible, but weekend nights, it is a a hangout for underage kids drinking. Uh, most of it being kids from Detroit because we're a border city. And the drinking age here in Canada is 19 and it's 21 in Detroit. So for three years there, no, two years. The Americans like to come here because they can get alcohol here and they can't there. The other thing is Canadian alcohol tends to be stronger and they don't always know how to handle it. But anyway, I kind of went off on a tangent there. Not everyone is comfortable walking around downtown Windsor and especially carrying a milk crate full of games. So I fully agree. This is something that you may watch where you're at, where you are participating matters and act appropriately. So on to pubs. Now there's nothing to say you can't bring the same games. It depends how pub like the pub is. Uh, There are some great games that are suited for pubs, though. Games that I think fit there better than fit at cafes. Though they, again, work at both. Here's where you break out your party games. You got your code names, your concept. But wait, there's more. Snake oil, telestrations, Dixit, Skull. Like, Skull is perfect. A pub, Skull is a deduction game that uses coasters. What better place to play a game using coasters than at a pub? Uh, One little thing you want to be aware of is your dice. Roll into a box. There are many drinking establishments where you do not want to go crawling on the floor looking for something that has gone off the table. That is true. Yeah, when I talked about spilled components earlier, where you spill components can sometimes be a little not so hot. So after a drink or two, even I can be convinced to play a few rounds of the Resistance or Coup. So here's where your social deduction games, I actually start to find them fun. Uh, At a pub with a few drinks is the only time you'll catch me playing many Take That games, like Flux, Munchkin, or Bang. Uh, Like many people are with uh, pool, a drink or two can help some folks relax and try out things they aren't otherwise interested in. Still, you do need to be aware. Watch for the overindulging. Correct. Now, Sean mentioned it before, but my absolute favorite games to play at pubs by far are dexterity games. There's something about the growing challenge of dexterity games that get harder the more you imbibe that makes them more fun. The more you drink, the more fun they tend to be. Plus, the other nice part is most of them are big, chunky games that aren't likely to be damaged or lose pieces or get bent or any of that and most of them are also easily cleaned we once played like 15 rounds of pitch car in a row at villains bistro like that is still by far my favorite pub game is to set up a track and people flicking it this is another one that's going to draw a crowd you're going to get people over like what is this like crokinole yeah it's like crokinole sorry for anyone not from ontario crokinole is a flicking game use a big hexagonal board and flicking little things anyway it's a race car game where you're flicking wooden race cars around the track uh villa paletti is a really cool game where you're it's it's like a gamer's jenga where you're trying to pull out towers and put them on top and stack stuff up uh junk art hamster roll which we mentioned earlier in this episode the other thing that is good about dexterity games is they're generally really easy to teach and that's good because at that point in the night sometimes people's attention spans tend to get a little shorter so simple and easy to teach is a benefit uh, another great couple of great options drop it the game not the topic yep. <laughs> uh and uh climbers uh, you have to watch out for the the little meeple but uh it's it's a f- great game for that sort of thing really trying to think about your your spatial awareness while your yep. spatial awareness is going out the window. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
So what I want to know for everyone listening in the chat room and so on, what are your tips and tricks for playing in public at pubs or cafes? I would love to hear what we miss, what I screw up, where are we wrong, where were we right? What do you do to game in public? Well, we've had a lot of talk going on. Uh, one of these great tips, uh, Random Scrub 23 talks about the padded box for dice rolling. Uh, they use a thrift store 4x6 photo frame with a worn out mouse pad to make their own nice and easy. Oh, nice tip. Very nice tip. I did see a whole bunch of games scroll by. I'll admit I haven't been totally watching the chat room, but I saw Past the Pigs. That's definitely one that I've seen people play at bars before. Uh, a little see, more well-known one. Steve D says, Everdell, Everdell will catch some eyes with that huge tree. That's that one with the big tree. Yeah, yes. that looks cool. I haven't played that game. But yeah, it's got a nice big tree setting up. I saw some talk of Hero Quest earlier. I wouldn't bring Hero Quest to the pub. <laughs> that uh, game's worth way too much money to bring to the pub, but it does get people's attention. Yep. Now, this was a great talk, but if you'd like to read more on this topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you will see this and other questions answered in blog form. Be sure to send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of the list. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and thank you to our backers. Misdirect and Mark, props to our brother podcast. You can join Chris, Phil, and Bob as they talk gaming and game mastering every Tuesday night. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Duran Burnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks for backing us. Well, that sounds like the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. We would like, you to, inv we would like to invite you to hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books after show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>